Good afternoon, Wolfgang, dear colleagues. Um, it's now almost 10 years ago. It was early 2007 during the PAA conference when Wolfgang asked me if I were interested to come to Vienna to build up a research group on health and longevity at the VID to establish this um, research there. And um, although at the beginning it was a difficult decision for a German to move to Austria, <laughs> and um, also without knowing really what I should, what I should expect, that this offer sounded just too good to say, to say no. And although I had no um, imagination about how, how great it um, could be, I must say that it was the, the, the best decision I could, have, I could have done. So thanks to Wolfgang's um, support, I had the most productive and successful years of my scientific life. And I'm extremely thankful to you for, for the support and I, I really will, will ever be. And um, it's, this, this support is not only the, the general support that he um, was, was pushing health and longevity research at, at the Vienna Institute of Demography or the Wittgenstein Center in general. It was also the, the, the direct support, and also this direct support not only with research ideas and research questions, but as you can see here, also from time to time as a co-author of our papers. So it just might be from all these areas that we cover at this conference, for some of you, the area that you connected maybe least with Wolfgang, but I can tell you that also here, he has a lot of expertise and a lot of good ideas that is, that is helping the research. So in particular, the, um, the research question of this paper was how human capital drives life expectancy, or in particular, how improvements of, um, in human capital drive and then influence increases in, in life expectancy. So as, as everyone here knows, reductions in mortality led to tremendous increases in life expectancy as it has been aptly described in the epidemiologic transition theory and um, later with the cardiovascular um, revolution. And when you look at the literature to, to find explanations what is driving these trends in life expectancy, so what are the causes, then you find this typical explanation, primarily medical advancements. For example, developments in screening, prevention, treatments of cardiovascular diseases, and of course also changing health behaviors have contributed, but let's say the focus lies on this direct risk factors for mortality. So this is what you find primarily in the, in, in the literature. However, in parallel to these trends in life expectancy, populations also experienced dramatic changes, as we have heard already in the early afternoon, in um, the education composition of the population, or the human capital of the populations. And the research question was simply, and this was basically Wolfgang's idea was driving this, to what extent did these changes in the educational composition of the population, so these changes in human capital, how much did they contribute to the increases in life expectancy? As you heard from Samir this, um, uh, this afternoon, this is also, of course, a directly was a pre-question to, to the question, how important is it to take into account for the projections of the education-specific mortality? So this was the starting point of this paper, and I'm very happy that I have the opportunity to present this research that is also directly related to Wolfgang's um, input here. So the increasing human capital could be very relevant in this context because it's strongly associated with mortality. So to illustrate this, we have already seen other illustrations today, but illustrate this, you see here on this graph, the difference in life expectancy at age 35, between high and low educated men and women in Austria, time trend from 1980 to 2010. And you see that this is not a marginal thing, so we are speaking here of differences of several years. It's around six years among men and around three years among <coughs> women. And what I think is most astonishing on these trends is this, that they do not change these differences. So whenever you look at the literature and then look at the explanation, so why are there these um, differences in life expectancy by education or by socioeconomic status in, dif and, and in general. It goes back to the early 19th century, the first study on life expectancy differences by socioeconomic status I know were done in, in France in, in 1820, and the differences were very similar. So although the disease environment changed, the risk factors changed, the differences remained more or less constant, and that 
shows that there must be something more behind this um, association than, than just some, so some risk factors that are associated with an education level. But what's also important is that this effect of education life expectancy is not just an effect of some early adult ages, so it continues until the highest ages. And to illustrate this, you see here um, a graph that shows you the trends in life expectancy at age 60. For men in Austria, the black line is um, the total male population of Austria, and the blue white line is um, high education here measured by ISCAT level 5, 5 and 6. And as you can, can see here also, the difference remains more or less constant in around three years, still at age 60. And thanks to Maria Winkler and her research, we can even extend this, because another important point is that this impact of education or human capital or socioeconomic status on life expectancy does not end somewhere. So it increases the more you go more into detail. And from Maria's studies, we know that the members of the Austrian Academy of Sciences have another three years advantage in life expectancy at age 16. So I pronounce this, I'm working at age 16. <laughs> But you see here another three years, and I'm sure when Wolfgang contributes here that this line goes even more up in the future. Okay, so we wanted to know, we know that there's a strong association between life expectancy and education level or human capital. So how does this influence the trends in life expectancy besides the direct changes of mortality? So in order to answer these research questions, we constructed average period life tables from age 30 by education level for 1990 and 2010 for three populations, Italy, Denmark, and the United States. And I, I know when I tell this so easily, it sounds as if this was an easy task, but it was extremely difficult to get data in a way that we have compar comparable data, mortality by education, population by education for, for three different populations, mostly for, for 1990, so it was extremely difficult. So Marina, one of the co-authors, and, and Graziella, she's, she's here, one of the other co-authors, um, they, they went to ISTA directly to, to get the data from the archives by, by hand. And so, and so it was extremely difficult to see here the data sources. In Italy, we use data from the National um, Statistics Institute, ISTAT. The data for Denmark comes from population registers and register linkage. And for the US, the population data comes from um, IPUMS USA and the mortality by education from um, the CDC. And with US, we had another problem that um, the mortality data did not separate by educational attainment, so we could not really um, use the ISCAT scheme. So it was um, it is, uh, defined by years of schooling, so we had to use this attain scheme to, to recode the test. But at the end, we managed that we have for all three populations um, similar way of life tables. We have three education levels, low, um, medium, and high. And what we did also um, in the same way for, for each is that cases with unknown education level were redistributed according to the valid cases by age and sex. This might be seen as a problem, but I don't think it is because the unknown cases are not that high in these three populations. And another thing we did is that we used the brass logic mo model for all three populations and life tables to extrapolate them to age 110 on the basis um, of the mortality rates from age 30 to, to 64, so that we had the same basis for all three populations. Um, we were nonetheless a little bit limited because at the end we had to adjust our life tables again to the availability of the population data by age, sex and education. So we had to close the life table at the end again at different ages. In the case of Italy it was 85 plus, uh, Denmark we could go to until age 110 and for the US it was age 90. Plus. But we tested also um, if the results are effective if we close all at 85 plus and there are only minor, minor effects of that. Okay, so the studied populations are, um, I think, very interesting for our research questions for a couple of reasons. So one is that they differ in the composition by education level and the changes between 1990 and um, 2010. What you see here on this graph is in the upper half of the graph for 1990, the lower of 2010. The composition of the living population by education level, low, medium, and high. And you see that we have significant changes in 1990. In Italy, almost 80% of the population had ISCAT level um, 1 or 2. In Denmark, it was a little bit more than half, and in, um, in the US, it was only around 22%. 
And when you look at 2010, you see that the situation changed, but still there are significant differences above all when we look at the redistribution of the education level. So just as an example, I don't know how did the um, lowest education level change and where did these decreases in the proportion of low educated people go? And you see in Italy, the um, low education level decreased by 23.6%, so this refers to the total population. And this, of course, went more or less, so the majority to the medium education, 16.4% and 70.2% to high education. In Denmark, we had by chance the same decrease in the level of um, low education, but you see here that the redistribution was more evenly across um, medium and high education levels. And in the US, we had the lowest absolute decrease in the low education level because the level was already very low, but you see here that this distribution was going mostly to the high education level. So we have very different distributions by education and very different trends in the three populations. And moreover, the three populations also differ um, in levels of life expectancy by education, differences um, by education and changes over time. So what these graphs here show you is again in the upper half for 1990, in the lower for 2010, life expectancy in age 30 for low, medium and high education and this red bar here shows you the um, overall level of life expectancy. And um, as you can see, first the difference is here was a maximum two and a half years between Denmark and, and Italy. But these differences became larger over time. So we see that in Italy, which had already the highest level of life expectancy in 1990, we saw also the largest improvements in life expectancy to 53. And in the US, life expectancy increased only by 2.8 years. And even more um, diverge were the trends in education-specific life expectancy. Here you see the gap between low and high education life expectancy in 1990. What was not so much different between the three populations, but when you look in 2010, it was very different. So it was increasing in all three populations, and it had 6.7 years in Italy, then in 2010 it was even going to 8.0 years in, in the US. So what I wanted to show here is that these populations are very diverse in terms of education distribution and in trends um, of, of life expectancy by education. So in order to answer our research question, we used the replacement decomposition technique um, as it was developed by Shkolnikov and colleagues from the Max Planck Institute in Rostock to estimate the effects of the changing education structure <coughs> on the changes in, in life expectancy. And um, I, I prepared a graph to demonstrate with how this method works, although in principle it does nothing different than, than any other decomposition technique. So the idea is that you have a level of life expectancy for the total population in 1990, what in our case is a result of um, the mortality levels by education at this time and the distribution by education, the population at this time. And we have the total life expectancy in, in 2010, so 20 years later, what is a result of the mortality levels at that time and the distribution by education at this time. And what um, the decomposition technique now is doing is that it is decomposing the differences between 1990 and 2010 in um, what Shkolnikov and colleagues call the M effect and the P effect. So M is the mortality effect and P is the population effect. And um, so M effect means the contribution of the changes in education specific mortality, assuming that the age composition of the population did not change and vice versa, the P effect how much did the dis change in the distribution of the population by education change the life expectancy, assuming that the mortality level remains constant. What the replacement decomposition technique um, makes so interesting in com comparison to the other techniques is above all this um, stepwise replacement. So this method um, is simulating every possible change for every single age, for every single education group, how one single um, change is affecting this, how two different age groups and so on. So we have a bulk of, um, of MNP effects at the end and the total effect is then just the average of them. This is what makes this um, method extremely um, interesting above all because it allows also to, to separate the mortality effect into the contribution of the different education levels as you can see here, although it was not, um, not our topic. Okay, so what did we find? We find that, um, in fact, while most of the increases in life expectancy were due to the M effect, to 
it was not such a big surprise, but because we should, um, should assume that most of the increase of life expectancy is due to the fact that mortality is um, reducing. But we also find a large proportion um, can be attributed to the, to the P effect, and um, I can speak for myself more than I had expected at the, at the beginning. So let's look at this graph here. It shows you um, here the change in life expectancy between 1990 and 2010. Here, before I showed you only numbers for the total population, here we have the first bar, this here is Italy, for the total population, this is here men, this is women, then Denmark, total men, women, and the US, total men, women. And um, the red colors show you the contribution in this change of the changes in education-specific mortality, assuming that um, the education composition did not change. Yeah, and you see that the different colors now um, indicate the different contributions of the education levels, but I don't go into detail here. So this reflects basically what I've shown you before with regard to the changes of the education composition. But the most important point is this blue bars here, and this is the P effect. The effect of um, what the change of the education structure of the population contributed to increasing mortality, if mortality would have not changed at all. And when we look at the numbers, you see that there's a variation. So the minimum values are here in the US, 0.4 years for women in the US, and the maximum value is 1.1 years that we find for Danish women and um, men, in, men in Italy. So these are absolute numbers. I think it's more interesting because the levels are so different when we look at the relative contribution. So this is here on the right side, here you see the changes in percent, so the same values that we have here, just I'm expressed in, in percent. And what you can see here is that the variation is not so big. We have in basically each population and subpopulation a contribution of 20% um, increase in life expectancy just due to the um, changes in the age composition of the population. We have one outlier here. This is um, Danish women, where the proportion is even 40%, and this reflects um, the fact that the Danish women are the population where we had the most extreme educational structure changes. So with the largest decrease of um, high, uh, low educated women and the largest increase of, of high educated women. So when you, when you see this, and I must say that um, this is the most conservative result that we got. So we tested, of course, the effect what is when we have different definitions of education. And when we have more education groups, for example, the effect here becomes much larger. So the results I showed you here are the lowest effects of the, um, of the composition change that we, that we found. So I think it's a quite significant change. And I, I think that this, being aware of that, has a lot of implications for, for many populations of the world. So just to, 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 to be brief, this graph here shows you that the association between education level and life expectancy is, is, is universal over every population. And even it becomes more linear with time. Let's just look at this left graph. Let's go on the right graph, the left. So here we have the mean years of schooling, and here we have the level of life expectancy for all countries of the world. The green dots um, refer to 1970, the orange one 1990, and the blue ones 2010. And you see that there's a very strong and constant association between life expectancy, mean years of schooling, and um, as you see here in this regression lines, that it appears that this um, association becomes even more linear, or at least what we can say, it seems that there's not a direct um, ceiling effect, that even in the populations with highest life expectancy and highest education levels, there's still a lot of potential to increase life expectancy just by further improvements in, in human character. Okay. I don't know if this was too fast, I could have shown you much more because when you start once to, um, to, to start with such an analysis, you get so many fascinating insights that it's difficult to stop. So let's conclude. I think that the findings of our studies have several important implications for health policy on the one side, but also um, with regard to the assessment of future trends in life expectancy on the other side. So let's sum up first the most important results. So there are the three points, I think, that stand out from our analysis. First, we found that there are considerable changes in the educational composition in all the three populations that we have looked at. We found that life expectancy shows a clear gradient by education in all three populations, and most importantly, that this gradient becomes bigger with the time. And last but not least, 
um, we found that the P effect, so the effect of structural changes in the population, um, contributed significantly to the improvements in life expectancy. In most population, subpopulation was around 20%, and um, the range was 16% among men in the US and 40% among women in, in um, Denmark. So what does this mean? I think it shows clearly that investments in education improve the health status of a population. Or in other words, um, we are supporting works of other colleagues who claimed already before that um, education policies should be seen in the framework of health policies, so that there's a very strong association and that there's a lot of potential that can be used. But nonetheless, I think one should never forget that all these positive implications that we have also very disadvantaged um, subpopulation and measures to improve the health of the less educated individuals um, should not forget and they are, they are needed above all. But when we think of this population that have more and more problems to catch up with the trends in life expectancy, they have also the effect that this population becomes more and more selected, so more and more problematic in terms of, of health and, and resources. And this is the last point. Um, Coming back to, the, to what does it mean for trends in life expectancy, so probably all of you know that there's this intensive discussion among mortality researchers between the optimists and the pessimists, the Vopel School and the Olshansky School. So the Vopel School claiming that life expectancy is like, most likely to go on um, to, to rise as in the past, while the Olshansky School rather says we have to expect a decrease of this increase on a flattening. And this effect of increasing education levels is completely missed for the optimists. So I think this is a strong point or an additional point for the optimists to, to support their view that life expectancy will continue to improve because also the education levels will improve. So let me thank the organizers at the end for this opportunity to present this research here. I'm very thankful for that and above all again to, to Wolfgang for all your support. Happy birthday and all the best for the next 60 years. Thank you.